and your wife's name? My wife is Phyllis Gloria. And I understand you have some children. I have three boys. Our oldest is Bradley uh, Joseph, and the middle boy is Tracy Michael, and my youngest boy is Thomas Vern. And you have grandchildren. And I have two grandchildren, a uh, granddaughter Elizabeth and a grandson Ronald. And do you mind my asking how old you are? I should say Ronnie because <laughs> we don't know him by Ronald. You know him by I'm Ronnie. I'm 74. 74 years old. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Northbridge, Massachusetts, uh, raised in generally in the Worcester area and in the Bangor, Maine. And you had siblings, brothers or sisters? I have, uh, yes, I have two brothers and a sister who has, who has died. And what was your parents' background? What did your father do? My dad was a, a millwright for the Woodall Company in Worcester. And my mom, she worked all her life too. She worked uh, in Northbridge in one of the textile mills. And, uh, and she worked right through the war. While I was in the service, she was, she was running milling machines. She was? Yes. Full time? Yes, yeah. So she was sort of a, a, a woman outside of the home before her time? Well, uh, no, not really at all. She, um, mostly she, she worked when, when she met my dad. No, no, she worked most of her life, come to think of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. She did work, but she, her, her family came first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, did any um, members of your family besides yourself enter the military? Uh, my dad was in the Navy in, in World War I, and, uh, and my brothers were all in. Mm -hmm. And when and where did you enter the military? I entered uh, in 1943 uh, in Worcester. And what branch of the military did you enter? I went head of the Navy because my dad was Navy. And was this at your own free will, or were you called up? Well, uh, I knew that the draft was not too far behind me, so I, and I wanted the Navy, so I, I joined up. They called it voluntary enlistment. And did any of your friends join at that time, too? Uh, well, no, but they, they all went in. About, about six months later, my, all my friends ended up in the service, so uh, I think I beat the draft by six months. And you said your brothers entered also? Oh, no, that was uh, much later. Later on? Yeah, much later. When was your first, where was your first basic training? My first basic training was at uh, Newport, Rhode Island. That's where boot camp was. And uh, uh, I think it wasn't too long, about 13 weeks or something like that. Did you enjoy that? Oh, I didn't dislike it. Did you, do you remember much about it? No, not no. really. Mm -hmm. And was it a time when you did or did not have close friendships with others that were in boot camp with you? No, you weren't in, this, in the boot camp that long really to make good friends. It wasn't until much later when I was stationed overseas that I met, made good friends. Mm -hmm. And in, in the Navy, in your service, were you um, classified for any type of specialty? Yes. And what was that? Well, I went to uh, uh, I went to gunnery school, uh, and uh, after ordnance school, I went to gunnery school, and I was classified as a combat air crewman. Can you explain before we get on to combat air crew what an ordnance school is? Well, <laughs> I wanted the same thing when I chose that as, uh, as one of my schools that I wanted to go to. And then I found out that ordnance was the, uh, the person that dealt with bombs and guns, and ammunition, fuses and rockets and all that kind of thing. And if I knew that before, I would have made that my first choice rather than my second choice. Sure. My first choice was for, for uh, uh, pilot, but I didn't have the training for it. So those who were more specifically trained in aviation got to be the pilots? No, people, I think, I think people who had uh, a more of a, 
uh, more of an educational background, I think, than I had. Mine was a technical background. I was, I went to a trade school, and I was a, a draftsman all my life. And how old were you when you first went into basic? I hate to skip back, but I should have asked you that earlier. Eighteen. You were eighteen years yeah. old, and you were out of trade school. Not really. I think I finished trade school when I came out of the service. So you were out of, or still in high school when you decided to? to I just graduated from high school did. when okay. I went in the service, yes. Out of Worcester. Okay. So then you became a gunnery specialist. Eventually, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us something about what transpired after basic, where did you go from there? Well, from uh, uh, boot camp in Newport, uh, I went to Jacksonville, Florida, to ordnance school. And uh, after ordnance school, to uh, uh, gunnery school. And, and where was that? That was in Hollywood, Florida. And uh, after gunnery school, back to Jacksonville for uh, operational training out of. We were flying PBYs out of Jacksonville. And can you explain what a PBY is? PBY is a big flying boat. The workhorse of the Navy. Is that what it was referred to as? Kind of, yes. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, it, and there's still some around today. Mm -hmm. So you were then sent back and you were going to be overseeing specifically what on the PBY? Uh, well, it didn't quite happen like that. Uh, I went to, uh, let's see, after operational training uh, in Jacksonville, we were assigned to, oh, after gunnery school, that's what it was. After gunnery school, we were uh, asked where we would like to go, and, and my several buddies that I had at that time, we, we decided the Pacific, of course, you know, because we had a choice of Europe or South America or the Pacific. Well, everybody knows there's beautiful girls in the Pacific, so we all chose that. And uh, our first assignment was supposed to be uh, uh, replacement gunners on a PBY Black Cat Squadron. And that turned out that that would have been the uh, down on Guadalcanal area where Jack Kennedy was at that time. Mm -hmm. But the thing kind of fell through. We kept going back and checking up with this lieutenant to see where our orders were. And they never came, and they never came, and finally, we found ourselves on a draft out to Kansas. We were surprised. Kansas? What were, we, what were the sailors doing out in Kansas? Well, that was a B-24 school, a special B-24 school that they wanted to send us to, and that was uh, called the PB-4Y2. It's a Navy version of the B-24. And we went to Kansas for um, probably a month and a half, two months, and then we came shipped back to San Diego, and then from San Diego they shipped us up to uh, a little Navy base up in just below San Francisco called Crow's Landing, and that's where we serviced a squadron of PB4Y2s. Out of, out of what was the name of the place again? Crow's Landing. Crow's Landing. <laughs> was it's this about 40 miles below San Francisco. Was this frustrating for you and your friends because you, you wanted to be out in the Pacific and you were still on shore, so to speak? Well, in a way it was, but uh, yes, we were, five of us were kind of upset at this lieutenant for not getting the transportation that we needed, but uh, what can you do about that? So did you spend most of your time over, how, how, how long a period of time were you in Crow's Landing? Uh, probably um, a matter of uh, maybe three months. And when you weren't ser servicing some of the equipment, what, what was a typical day like? When we weren't servicing right. equipment? Right. Well, we always were servicing equipment. Okay. Did you have any kind of time off? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. when you had time off, you would, you'd take off uh, the nearest town. In that, in that case, it was uh, Modesto, California. 
mm -hmm. and we'd go fishing. But I remember one day catfishing and uh, coming back with a whole string of catfish to this little town of uh, Newman, California. And we gave them to a farmer who, uh, they called him, a, he called himself a rancher because he had a ranch, everything in California. And uh, he was so appreciative, he brought us all to his house that night, and his wife made a big spaghetti dinner for us. So you felt a little bit at home. Yeah, right. Mm. They really mm. welcomed you. Uh-huh. During this time period, were you hearing about any other actions that were occurring oh, in the Pacific or elsewhere? Of course, yes. We, we were currently, we knew what was going on all over the, all over the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At what... Because we were still in the States, you know, we had... Just like just like you did in in the uh, in your home. Mm -hmm. And at what point in time were you able to go overseas? It's my understanding you were in. Uh, let me see now. It was it was that was kind of a frustrating thing too because we were uh, one day we were informed that we had uh, that we had our transportation lined up for going overseas, and uh, we were. We had to uh, get all our gear together, and in the Navy, you know, the the the, the Navy carries all its bedding with them, and it isn't like the Army. So you you have your hammock and your blankets and your pillow and and you and then your sea bag. Everything you own is in your sea bag, and you sort of make you, you roll up the hammock and you tuck the sea bag in there and you tie the strings together, and then you jockey the whole thing up on your shoulder and carry it. That's the way you travel in the Navy. Well, we had, <laughs> I, was, I was a small guy, 140 pounds, I think. No, 119 pounds when I went in. I didn't, I didn't get up to the 140 yet. And that sea bag was a hard thing to carry. So I'm lugging that thing. And you have to be in, the, in line and in a certain order because they're checking your name off, you know. And uh, we, we went down to uh, 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 the uh, harbor area. We, we loaded onto a boat. And when that happened, the, uh, that was a funny thing too, because the, uh, the, uh, the boat it was an AKA transport, and it was tied up at the harbor. But depending on how the tide is, the, a ladder comes down from the boat down to the ground, and there's a, a rollers on the ladder so it can go up and down with high tide. Sure. Well, the, this particular day, the tide was high because the ladder was very steep, and. Uh, here we, we looked and we had to climb up this gangway with this sea bag on our shoulders. And some of the guys, you know, had other stuff, a small bag beside. One guy had a steel guitar <laughs> with him beside his hammock. And, uh, and all the while this was happening, there was a platoon of Marines that were all in dress blues. They were standing at ease, all, you know, with their rifles and everything. And all they had is just a, a sea bag, you know. And, they're watching our operation, watching us load onto the ship. And one of the guys, one of our guys, as he's struggling up this ladder, and there's a, just a rope, a rope a railing on one side was all. And the, so that's all you had to hang on to. He gets up very near the top, and he kind of lost his balance, and everything he owned goes over the side. Into the water. Into the water. Oh my, but he didn't fall over, did no, he? No, he didn't fall over, but he it could have. He came pretty close. And the Marines all kind of broke up, you know. <laughs> now, why do you think the Marines were there? Well, they, they were there for some dignitaries that might have been on the ship, on the I ship. guess. I don't think they were there because of us. Mm -hmm. So then what happened with, with you once you got on the ship? Once we got on the ship, we were heading for uh, Hawaii. And uh, we, I remember cruising under the Golden Gate Bridge and going past Alcatraz and uh, and looking up at the people that were looking at over the rail at the bridge. And then we started pit picking up rough water after that. And uh, then we were on our way to Hawaii. And uh, as we were loading, by the way, as we were loading, our outfits got split up. And half of us, half of us got held back. And half of us went, half of them went ahead. And uh, uh, what, what happened when we finally caught up with them, the guys that had been ahead of us were already in Hawaii when we got there. So they were, come on, you know, it was just chow time at the time, and they said, come on, let's get some chow. So and between the time you entered at the age of 18 and the time you got to Hawaii, 
Approximately how much time had transpired at that point? Oh, I think probably, uh, probably a year. A year. Yeah. So a year later, you're finally, you think, you're finally... Yeah. And, and so once you hit Hawaii, what, what occurred? Well, in Hawaii, we're now waiting for another bit of transportation, and uh, uh, it turned, turned out that we were on a LCT, landing craft tank, I think it was. It was kind of a small, small ship, and we had a convoy of 17 of these that were carrying us out to uh, Guam. And while you're doing this, what's happening around you, I mean, with regards to the actions of the war? Oh, well, we hear news, we hear news about uh, the different Navy actions, and I think the Franklin was sunk around that time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, were you ever concerned, or were you too young to be concerned? No, I wasn't concerned. We weren't concerned, no. Weren't. We didn't have enough brains to be concerned. So that you're on your way now, and, and, and walk us through what happened. I mean, where, where you thought you were going or where you ended up? Well, we, we knew that our destination was Tinian because uh, I had worked out a code with my folks that when, uh, when I found out where I'd, I'd be, that I'd send them a letter and I would talk about some people that uh, they didn't know, and I'd use the first letters of these names to spell out where I was going. And tell us where Tinian is. Tinian is in the Marianas Islands. Uh, it starts off at uh, uh, Guam, mm -hmm. and there's a whole series of islands that run up to Tinian and Saipan. And these are, uh, uh, oh, probably, you know, off of a, a good distance away from Japan. Mm -hmm. Eleven-hour flight to Japan from there. Mm -hmm. And how long did it take you to get to Tinian? Oh, that was a very, very long trip. It was, I called it a slow boat to China because it was uh, this convoy of 13 LCTs. I think we probably, uh, I, I, think I've, I think I mentioned it in my, in my report that I wrote uh, upon, you know, thinking about it more. But I think it was a couple of weeks. No, it couldn't have been that long. It but was it a long, long trip, long mm -hmm. trip, yeah. And, and during that time period, were, were you given duties on a daily no. basis? No. So how did we you... We were passengers. <laughs> you were passengers going over to Tinian. How did you spend your day? Well, I remember reading uh, a lot. I, you know, the, the LCT has got a little a flat bow door that drops down when they're, when they're invading, and it drops it down, and there's room for, I think, two or three tanks to come out of this thing. And when the bow door was up, it was a nice shady spot because we're have, traveling due west and all the day, all the day long, the sun would be coming down there. I found this spot a good, great place to, to sit and read my, my book. What type? One of the books I read was uh, Donovan's Brain, a tape paper bag. I'll never forget that book. What was it about? It was about <laughs> It was about a man whose brain was uh, was kept alive in a tank. <laughs> it's kind of scary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you found a comfortable location in a situation that wasn't very comfortable for all of you. Was there a lot of illness, seasickness, or anything? No, well, well, well mm, no illness, but seasickness. Yes, one boy was seasick the full the full time, all every day and every. Every day of the week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So once you reached Tinian, you were still with some friends. Yeah. And tell us what occurred, how you got established there, and what your routine would be. Well, uh, we landed at Guam, and uh, and they they lined us up into a, they they got us uh, set into a DC three to fly up to uh, Tinian, and there were. Uh, these were all of the same guys that I went to that school in Kansas with. Mm -hmm. So we were B-24, PB-4Y2 specialists at that time. And uh, uh, well, let's see, uh, when we arrived at Tinian, they brought us up to an area where our work, where our living area would be with these 
Quonset huts. And uh, you just picked out a bunk of your own and, and you were in business. So Found out where the mess hall was and where everything else was and that was it. What was the weather like? Ideal. Tinian had the ideal weather, the garden spot of the Pacific. We saw a sign as we came into our camp area, and it really was. Beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you and your friends probably tried to bunk together in Well, no, we were assigned to a, to a hut. That you was were. That was our hut, so that we were all together anyway. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you had to take care of the B-24s and the BP4Y2s, you call them, PB. Right? <laughs> PB, I'm sorry. PB4Y2s. PB4Y2s. So, the pilots, give us, give us a, an idea of what a typical day would be like for you, for the pilots, for the crew. Well, okay, each, each airplane has a, a plane captain. He's a, usually a mechanic, and he's in charge of of uh, keeping that plane in good flying condition, ready to go at a moment's notice. And uh, uh, in our group, we had, we had people who were ordnance, like myself. We had to take care of all of the machine guns, all the bombs, any, anything that they needed in that respect. The sheet metal workers had to do repair work on different things, and they had to, like, uh, I think they changed tires and things like that. And the mechanics, of course, worked on the engines. And, uh, now, were you assigned to specific planes or all planes in general? All, all planes in general. Uh, you, you, you're sort of in a, like in a pool. You know, the plane captain puts an order in. He needs certain work done. It goes to a, a point. They send you out for an ordnance job, or they send a mechanic out for a mechanic's job. Mm -hmm. And then the plane would be considered ready or... Were there ever times when you were called up on an emergency to get planes ready sooner rather than because of some oh, yes. situation? Mm -hmm. were, you, were you normally told what the situation was or you really didn't know other than the fact that they had to go? They just had to go, yeah. Mm -hmm. What was it like when they didn't come back? Uh, I don't know any of our planes that didn't come back, but we do know that uh, in, on our on our island, there were B-29s also, and the B-20. As a matter of fact, the Enola Gay took off from Tinian. Really. And we could see them f flying every day. And uh, yeah, there were a lot of crashes that we saw and witnessed. Did you? Was the Enola Gay treated differently because of their reputation? What reputation? Well, <laughs> no, it, no, no, you don't understand that. Uh, the old, the Enola Gay was just another airplane at that okay. time. It wasn't until after, after that you found out that that people started feeling their things about the Enola Gay. Okay, right. I, I I write about that in my book too. And I, one of my comments is, President Truman, you did the right thing. It's now you know my feelings about it. About the bombing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you felt that it had to end the war? Well, um, one day some of my friends took one of the bomb trucks and toured the island and we explored all around different places and up through the hills and, it would, you know, these bomb trucks are pretty rugged, they'll go pretty much anywhere. So we explored caves and found stuff like that. We found sake bottles and things like that. We came around a corner onto a big work area where a bunch of CBs were building a big foundation, the biggest foundation I ever saw in my life. I said, what the devil is that for? And, and the, one of the CBs said, well, he said, we're going to invade, aren't we? And of course, I'm kind of naive, you know, I said, in, in, well, yeah. And I've seen the, some of the stories about the Marines taking these caves cave by cave, island by island, all the way from Guadalcanal, all the way up to Okinawa. I know how much death there is and how much loss of life there is. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess we are going to invade, and I guess we do need a receiving hospital. So, that was kind of a shock to me. Mm -hmm. But, I agree that it, it, it was a needed thing. Then later on, when we came back to uh, our own work area, 
after work, we had, we had a little beer garden that we used to go to, and our ration was two cans a day. Mm -hmm. So uh, after work, you'd, you'd be up at the beer garden having your two cans and shooting the breeze with your buddies. And, and we could look across three miles to the north and see Saipan. And uh, one day someone said, hey, did you see all those ships building up on Saipan? And I'm thinking, yeah, how about that? And there were all kinds of ships. They were big ones, little ones. They were, you know, big military ships, you know. I mean, fighting ships. And it seemed like one was tied up to the other, to the other, to the other. And every day you'd look, and it would go further and further out to sea. And one day, we were at the beer garden having a beer. Looked out, the ships were all gone. What the devil is that all about? And someone said, well, the invasion must be on. And I'm thinking, oh, mm. that's going to be terrible. Mm. And did you hear about it? And then we heard. You did. Then we heard that the bomb had been dropped. And what was your initial reaction? I mean, I know you're Relief. saying that it was the right thing, but had you heard about it, what had happened in the cities? No, not at that time. Mm -hmm. Not until mm -hmm. much, much later. Mm -hmm. Was there a discomfort level or a fear of what might transpire after that on the tiny island of Tinian? Or, or were you feeling fairly safe? We felt very safe. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody, there was a rumor that there were 17 more bombs stored on the island. And uh, those little islands, they're like a mushroom. You know, they've got a little narrow base and it, the island part is the mushroom, the top of the mushroom. And if anything like that blew up, it would, the whole thing would go into the, the deep Mariana's Trench, you know, you mm -hmm. figured. So uh, it, was, it was scary in that respect, but not, it wasn't really scary. We, because, you know, that was a controlled type thing. We didn't uh, fear that. Was there ever rumor or did you ever see any Japanese on the island? You had mentioned finding sake or things in the uh, caves. Did you ever see? Yes, well, no, we, we, no, we never, we never, I never saw any Japanese, but uh, one, one day uh, uh, the master at arms was driving up the airstrip on, uh, toward the front of the airstrip, and he had a, they call it a follow me jeep. When a plane would land, a follow me jeep would come up, and he had a big sign on the back, follow me, telling the plane, follow him, and he'd bring him to the parking area. Well, the master in arms got a bullet hole through his windshield, <laughs> and I don't think that was uh, one of our guys. So they knew maybe there might be a few hiding out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When something like that happened, did a group go off and try to find the individuals? Well, one day, yes, we we were assigned to that duty. You know, we were issued a carbine and uh, and we're tramping through the jungle. Where first we stretched out arm to arm, we could touch each other's fingertips. And that's how we a big line. And then we started going through the jungle and uh, to try to f see if there was anybody we could flush out there. And, uh, and I'm trudging along and trudging along. And, and pretty soon, I couldn't even, I couldn't hear this guy. I couldn't hear the guy over there. I felt like I was all by myself, you know? And I ran into a hornet's nest. <laughs> <laughs> and I dropped my gun and ran. <laughs> then I had to go back and, and get, get the, the gun. gun. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you never found no, any never of found the enemy. Anybody, no. Was that prior to the hornet's nest? Was that a scary time for you? I, no. Uh -oh. Too young. Yeah, too young. At the at that time, you were probably what, 19 years old. Probably, 19. yeah. So then, how long were you on Tinian? Uh, let me see. Uh, about a year, I guess. A whole year. And what, what do you think were some of your greatest challenges being there as such a young man? Greatest challenges? Mm -hmm. We didn't have any challenges. Keeping, certainly keeping the equipment up to speed had to be of the utmost importance to you. Yes. Dealing on a daily basis with things like bombs and um, rockets and um, the guns. Were there ever any scary moments 
for instance, getting them on the plane, or funny stories? Yeah, there was. There was one that was kind of a funny story, but this happened before we shipped overseas. We were still in California at Crow's Landing, I told you about. And that we had, we had uh, just come from a, a patsu party the night before. And what is that? Uh, oh, patsu is the name of our, our group, okay. Patrol Air Service Unit, okay. patsu 44. And uh, uh, we were, some of us were feeling kind of groggy from the party, and, and it was time to load, load bombs for the uh, air crew to drop live depth charges for the first time. So everybody was kind of excited about this. Now a depth charge is, uh, is a, it's got a big blunt nose, it's a big fat thing, you know, and, and the fuse goes through the center. Part of it goes through one side, part of it goes through the other side. And where the two fuses come together, it's like a cup in a, in a, in a, in a socket. And it's springs behind here, and sea pressure that forces these together at a certain depth. That's when they blow up. Now what keeps these from going together is, what keeps the seawater from coming in to go, is an arming wire that attaches to the, to the plane. And that goes through a little place, and so now the, nothing can happen. So one day we were loading uh, uh, bombs for the air crew to go out for, to practice and drop these depth charges. So we're sitting out there. It's a nice warm day, and I'm stripped to the waist, and I got, I got my legs like this. I've got a bomb right between my legs, and I'm fusing the bomb. I mean, I'm attaching the arming wires to the bomb. We had already fused them earlier that morning. And uh, our warrant officer came by in charge of the ordnance gang, and he, he was making sure that everything was safe. And he said, are you sure, is the quadrant in the safe position? Well, the quadrant is the release lever. You, 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 and you learn this in school to test it. You press the button, you pull it, click, 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 so you're sending it through all the positions, and then you bring it down and all the way back to salvo. So you're dropping everything that you've got, and then you bring it back and leave it in the safe position. That's the way we were told how to test it, you know, how to, how to leave it in the safe position. So here we are, we're just loading these bombs. We've got some of them loaded already, we've got some of them up into the rack. And they're all armed, and the arming wires are hooked onto the racks. And the guy says, uh, the warrant officer says, are you, are you sure the arming, the, uh, the uh, quadrant is in the safe position? Now there was an air crew guy that was standing right near the nose wheel, and he says, I'll check it, sir. And Zippo, he goes up into the bombardier's compartment. Now he was the air crew that was going to fly in that plane. So <laughs> he did just what they told him. Click, 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 boom, and then salvo. And of course, the bomb we already had loaded dropped and it fell right here, right beside me. And it, I looked over and it's rocking back and forth gently, and the arming wires are dangling all over the place. <laughs> well, that was kind of scary. So you knew immediately what had happened. Yes, but you know, it would take water pressure to set it off, but, so but, there but really was wasn't any danger. But did you know that immediately, or was there an instant fear? No, or? I know. I oh, knew that immediately. Thank goodness. Yeah. Thank goodness. I knew it immediately, but I was scared, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you maintained a fairly good friendship with some of these people on Tinian. They had also been in ordinance school with you. Did you, after, did you, did you continue to keep a friendship with them? I met, uh, I, I visited with one of the guys, as a matter of fact, from New York. He came up to our house in Worcester. And, uh, and I'm still uh, uh, thinking of trying to get a hold of another guy that was up in Manchester, New Hampshire. There was another guy up in Lee, uh, up in, uh, no, another guy up in New Hampshire, one guy in New York. Uh, and that's the only ones that I've, oh, one guy in Nebraska. And so, I, so you I've had talked to him on the phone a couple of times. Mm -hmm. So after Tinian, tell us what went on. You were there for a year, and then did you ship home? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, uh, in, the, in the service you have a, a point system to determine who goes home first. And uh, on Tinian we had, 
Army guys that were working on the docks, we had uh, Okinawans who were working with the Army people on the docks, and th these guys had been all shipped back to their to Okinawa by that by this time. The Army guys had all gone home on points, and what few of us were left were trying to build up points to go home, and we had uh, this merchant ship, this. Uh, the one I showed you the picture of. I, the John Miller? The John Miller. Mm -hmm. I couldn't think of his name, yeah. The John Miller was assigned to carry some ambulances back. And uh, who was going to load the ambulances? Well, there was five of us that were <laughs> looking for transportation home, and we were selected. And, uh, and we, so we did it. So were you, again, passengers on the merchant ship? So now we were just passengers, mm -hmm. yeah. And how long did it take you to get home? Oh. That wasn't very long. That was, I don't know, a couple of days, I guess. That was about it. And did you come in through California? Frisco, yes. Mm -hmm. And did you stay out there for a while? No, I, I was discharged in Shoemaker, California, mm -hmm. and uh, I arranged my transportation to stop at uh, Omaha, Nebraska on the way to visit with my, one of my buddies who had been discharged just a, a matter of weeks ahead of me. And so now you're discharged, you're probably, what, close to 20 years old at this point in time? Uh, I think I'm 21 by now. And what did you think was in store for you? Were you planning to then come back to Worcester? Yeah. And, and so tell us what transpired there. Well, my, my plan, of course, was to go back to school. I, I had, uh, through, all through high school, I had taken uh, uh, courses that would sort of lead me into a, a machinery, a machine design area. I wanted to be, become a, uh, an engineer. And um, uh, so that's, that's what I did. I went back to uh, trade school. Uh, I, no, I started trade school. That's what it was when I got back. I worked with my dad for a while. We, we did a couple of projects around the house. and. Uh, uh, I, I joined that 5220 uh, fi club for, I think, a, a couple of months. Now, we, someone else has mentioned the 5220 club. Why don't you explain what that is? 5220. That's $20 a week for 52 weeks. And we enjoyed it. And that, that was, I guess it was designed to, to get all us young guys uh, you know, working again. And, Back. and what was it like? no one looked for a job. We were just spending yeah. it. Not quite ready to look and settle down. No, well, I, I only did it for about two months, I guess, and then I started school. September, the school, when school started, I went back to trade school. What was it like coming home? It was great. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, this is, this is, in this era, we were all heroes, you know. Mm -hmm. So everybody was, uh, was was great. It was everything was great. And you went to trade school. And then, while in school, were you also working? Yes, I was. As a matter of fact, I, I was working in a, a little uh, specialty sh store shop that was right near my house. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, you know, uh, we, they sold everything from silk stockings to pound of bologna, you know, all that kind of thing. And you were still single at this time? Oh, yes. And after trade school, where did you go to work? Uh, after trade school, I went to work at uh, a company called Rice Barton in Worcester. It's a paper machine manufacturer, paper making machine manufacturer. And did you work there for a great length of time? I worked there for, I think, three years. Mm -hmm. And when did you meet your wife? Oh, that was uh, one of my leaves coming home. W when I came home from Kansas, that's when I met my wife. Mm -hmm. Is she from around this area? She was from around the uh, College Hill area. College Hill in Worcester? In Worcester, yes. Okay. And when did you get married? Uh, Hmm. A few years, uh, you know, we went together for a few years before we got married. Mm -hmm. How important do you feel serving in the military was? 
Well, at the time, it was a must. Mm -hmm. And how do you think it affected the rest of your life? <laughs> no problem there. It would, it, it's something that you that you needed to do, that needed to be done. And I think uh, it, in those days, you know, there was no objecting to to the to the draft. Everybody went in because they they knew they had to go in. It was. And you wanted to go in. So when you get out, everybody was glad you were out. And you had mentioned earlier when you came home you were all treated as heroes. One of the questions that we've asked a number of our uh, other veterans, which I'd like to ask you now, is how you feel about the difference of public opinion towards the veterans of World War II, your generation, during the, and also during the Korean conflict and then the Vietnam War. What do you think the difference was? I think there probably is a difference. I don't know why, and I don't think there should be. And I feel that the Korean and the and the uh, uh, Vietnam veterans probably deserve more respect than the World War II guys do. And why do you say that? Because they had a much tougher life, a much tougher war to fight. I, I had, myself, I didn't see any combat. I, I, I was extremely fortunate. I think I, had, I enjoyed that whole trip. Uh, I liked it. Mm -hmm. I'd do it again. Uh, I, sometime a, a few years ago, I saw an ad for Squantum, Squantum Mass, looking for some ex Air Force people or ex-flying people. And I looked at that and I said, oh, I'd love to be doing that. Mm -hmm. And I thought too that what I should have done when I got out was to join the Coast Guard, and especially in the, in the air, air end of it, because I enjoyed that life. That was fun, fun, fun. So looking back now, you wish you had continued in, as you said, the Coast Guard or something similar to uh, that? Yeah, from a retirement basis I do, but uh, you know, at the time I had a life to get on with and I had some education to get and I became a machine designer and uh, I wouldn't pass that up for anything. And you, you are in retirement now. Yes. And you became a machine designer, you said, and, and what was, where was the bulk of your work done? What, what type of business were you in or what company were you with? I worked for and was a part owner of an engineering company uh, located right here, started right here in Natick, named Dynamac, and uh, we, we, we ended up with probably as many as, many as uh, at one time, maybe 90 people that were all designers, draftsmen, working on a drawing board, but our work really was for clients all over New England, so we, a lot of times we were sent to a to a client's plant to work in his plant. And sometimes the work was done in the home office. But we was, I like to describe us as a design and build machinery that, ha, that no one has ever built before. And how long were you with that group? Uh, I was with them for, I'm, I don't know, I can't remember the dates or anything, but uh, all my life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is it still in existence today? No, no. Mm -hmm. They were sold out to a California outfit. Mm -hmm. Is there any thought or memory or comment that you would like to share right now with not only your family but with the community or groups that may view this tape in the future? Well, um, for myself, uh, I, I don't really have any thoughts about my, my own time in the service, but I do wish that people would feel better about the Vietnam veterans and the Korean veterans, mm -hmm. because those, those are the guys that really... I work with one of them, by the way. He refers to the killing fields. Well, he does it jokingly, but I know that he doesn't, he's not joking, he means it. That it bothered him, what yes. he had experienced. Yes. Do you feel there might be now a change of opinion 
by the communities regarding the veterans of those wars? I certainly hope so. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd like to thank you this morning for coming in and telling us one more portion of experiences during the World War II generation. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.